that you speak to more people, you're like, Ooh, okay. Start five, piece it together. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. five, four, three, two, one. Hello, Dr. Kulka. And thank you for being on the make life rich movement podcast. How are you today? Good. How are you doing very well? My That's Richies, great. we are in for an absolute treat today. We are speaking with a 20 year plus physician who in my eyes has really taken a stance on how they care to be a physician. And I think you're going to be very surprised to hear that this particular doctor has taken it upon himself to completely invigorate and renovate the way in which he runs his practice. And I'm just so excited for him to share his expertise and what he's working on is working on as well as how he has structured his practice to better serve his uh, patients. And I just, um, I, I applaud you so much first for that aspect of things. And I'm very excited to hear your expertise on all things health and wellness, but could you tell me what your first real core memory was of recognizing that you wanted to be a doctor, you wanted to help people and, and that wellness was going to be your focus? That's a good question. First of all, thank you for having me. I really appreciate uh, you having me on today. It's very nice of you. Um, so I have a little bit of a convoluted past. Um, when I was young, I, I, I love science. I actually uh, remember going to a nursing home where my um, grandmother was um, and, and then for grandfather and actually enjoying it where a lot of people were kind of afraid of being in nursing homes. I enjoyed talking to the older people, hearing their stories and what was happening around them. Um, so that maybe put it in my head that maybe I wanted to work with people and in science, but somehow I got off the track and um, ended up in, uh, in college and business. Um, though I had several friends who were pre-med and I would look at their books and talk to them and say, you know what, I really find this much more interesting than accounting and finance and all the other classes that I was taking. Um, and at that time, uh, my father was actually ill. Um, so I was visiting hospitals um, and I was around, um, around medicine and uh, ill people and care. Um, it piqued my interest even more. Uh, I discussed with my parents maybe going back to school, uh, staying an extra year for, to get a degree in, in chemistry or biology. And then I said, oh, I'm too old. I'm not going to do that. Uh, so then I ended up <laughs> moving to New York, working in business for a few years, and then saying, you know what? I just think I still had that bug in my head about wanting to go back and learn more and contribute more. So I took a class, and then I took another class, and another class, and then eventually I uh, was finished with my pre-med pro- program and uh, applied to medical school and went in a, little, a few years later. Oh, which, I love that. which is now now more common. Back then, it was not the norm, though there were certain there were several people. I was four years out of college when I went in. Um, that wasn't uh, very popular, but there was a mm-hmm. few people my age and older. But now that's pretty common. Yeah, I love so much that it uh, it, it made me chuckle. I'm I'm 39, which is still f- fairly young. You're fairly very young, young as well. But I love that you thought that you were too old in college. I, I love that 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 framework was still there. Um, yeah. w- when you did kind of start taking these classes, did you really feel like accounting, you know, and l- bless all of those who love statistics, numbers, accounting, we need you, we need you so much. Right, right. But My son, was there right. a moment? Yeah, gosh, like, <laughs> thank you for doing yeah. all of this for us. <laughs> was there a moment where in these classes, you felt like your purpose just kind of like kick in where you're like, oh my gosh, okay. Four years was no wait. I'm here. This is what I was meant to do. Yes. The first class, first class I took, I said, I love this. I love it. I, you know, I had to study hard because it was, you know, newer. I had to refresh from high school day from the high school days. Um, Mm -hmm. but, uh, I fell in love with it and it wasn't a chore. You know, I I mean, I love putting the time in, I I could pretty much study almost forever. Um, it wasn't really, it wasn't a chore and, uh, people would say to me, Oh my God, you have such a long road going in later, but I, I enjoyed all of it. So yes, it was hard and frustrating at times, but no, from the first class on, I knew I was in the right place as long as I could keep doing it and, uh, and stay with it. And then, you know, take the testing that's required, the MCAT and so forth. And that worked out. Oh man. So you're in, in the phase of becoming a doctor, you're learning, you're educating yourself when it came to your clinicals and kind of being in that hospital setting, was there a core memory within that period when you were training to become a doctor, when you first became a doctor that you kind of second guessed the way things were conventionally being done in terms of the hospital setting or patient interactions? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say from the beginning, there, you know, the world isn't perfect, and I guess everybody who who is a professional or works for a while in their field, you always pick apart things that could be better. So mm-hmm. from from early on, from the first rotation, you know, that you see there's not enough time and um, to spend with people, and that still uh, the um, the core beliefs in medicine, you know, weren't as they said they were, you know, you, you, you want to work on prevention, you want to work on care and follow up, but there's not enough time to put those core uh, methods into practice. Even from the beginning, you see that early on, though you try to do the best you can and you see people are doing the best you can, but there's always, you, you think there's other, there could be a better way. Yeah, for sure. I, I, um, I'm very cautious to, uh, I'll state this, at no point within this conversation do I want to blame or doctors do amazing work. We would be absolutely lost without you. I think there's a lot of administrative um, renewals and upheavals that are in the process of happening and will continue to happen as we keep evolving. But I think the industry of medicine seemed to have gotten bottlenecked a bit within the the very quick period of growth we have between the, what feels like the 90s and maybe 2010 area within the medicinal field. And then I think from there, it seems like it's been quite a bit of catching up that is happening with how people like to serve in their capacity of being a physician, as you do, and how people like to be seen by their physician. And I do think it's it's catching up very slowly. It's such a huge industry undertaking to even attempt to do what you've been able to do within your private practice. But I was so eager to speak with you because I do really believe that you are at the forefront of the way that medicine will be done on a case by case basis when you are kind of in charge of the administrative overhead and figuring out the business aspects of how you are running your personal practice. Um, Did you find moments where you did kind of work your way through schooling and then it was time to decide, okay, where am I going to land my feet to get them wet for my first bits of my career? Were, were you kind of transitioning somewhere else before starting with your own private practice or did you just go right into private practice? So I knew pretty early on that I wanted to do my own thing, you know, that I wanted to be in my own practice. But uh, for the first year, I couldn't find anything that was uh, that I was able to take over or I didn't have um, I had fear in starting my own practice right away. So I landed a, a, a nice position at a, a hospital close to where I live with my wife and where she grew up, um, where I worked actually for a year. And it was, it was a decent practice. Um, it was a good practice and a good hospital system. Um, but I had that, you know. Uh, that calling to open my own practice. And then I had a call from someone who heard that I was looking. And then soon enough in my own town, uh, I started, a, I, I took over a practice a year after um, I started working in the, in the hospital system. Oh, how beautiful that you got so to that go back to out. your hometown. Yeah. Where it all started and kind of. Yeah. And it was an 85 year old woman who has been practicing. This was 2002. Um, she was practicing since 1942. Um, so it was an old practice. Uh, it's an amazing career, 60 years by stepping into that one. Yeah. What a beautiful heritage brand to kind of inherit. That's really yeah. cool. Really cool. Now, did you feel in this moment of kind of transitioning into your own practice that you were really thankful for that business degree? Was there a moment where you were kind of like, Oop, I know what to do here. Like I see something uh, yeah. over here for marketing. I see something over here for organizing. Like what were the yes. first things that you kind of tackled? So, I mean, I, yeah, I could see from when I went in uh, that uh, it, it wasn't well managed in terms of business. Luckily, I did have that little bit of business background where I actually knew what a debit and a credit was and mm-hmm. an amortization table and how to balance a checkbook. So, um, yeah, they weren't, she wasn't, and I don't fault her, she wasn't paying attention to the cost of vaccines um, or even charging for them at times. Uh, so I really was had to look at that and um, and just kind of, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just basic arithmetic, but put that into motion in the practice. Uh, so that was one of the first things I had to do, look at the costs and expenses, especially when you're starting out. I had a new house and uh, a new family, and I had to make sure that I could make a living. So but luckily, I had a little bit of a background in that. That was very helpful. I think it's um, it's always a, overlooked, I think, that people don't understand that most times, especially if you're in a smaller town, the doctor office that you visit is typically owned by one or two or a few of the doctors and clinicians that are in the space. And 
I think when we look at it from that framework, there's always a little bit more leniency and grace that's given to people being so frustrated with the healthcare system and feeling like they're not getting the help that they need and there isn't enough time. And um, did you find in those first weeks to months of transition that people were a little bit used to an old school way of having things done for them because they had that doctor that started so young before things got really pushed and crazy and money driven? Or was it easy for you to kind of transition them into more of the style that you were looking to implement within the business structure of your, of your senior patients? It definitely was a little difficult when you're, you're, you're going into a practice where someone's been practicing one way for 60 years, you know, um, and they kind of, their practice was in a little bit of a time capsule. Like they would have family charts where there'd be four or five people in the, in the same family and they'd be, it'd be in the same chart. That's not really HIPAA, you know, um, allowed, right? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit against HIPAA rules. Um, and, and they had, you know, one line type of uh, diagnosis, which was kind of nice back then strep amoxicillin, you know, you didn't have to write a long note um, because it was a different type of way of practicing. So people had to get used to the way I practiced. It was a little bit um, uncomfortable in the beginning, but I have to say everybody was really nice and sweet. And most of the people got used to me pretty quick, but there was probably a year or two of, um, you know, fitting in that it took a while. It takes a few years. And then after that, it was kind of smooth sailing after a while. I love that. Yeah, I'm sure you can expect growing pains in any kind of capacity, but it's it's very good to hear that I'm sure... They noticed too that you weren't some newfangled like doctor that's going to come in here and all right, we're going to six minute appointments. I need to be able to pack right. in 30 people today. Let's make sure we're getting 15 prescriptions out. I have this drug rep coming at this time, block off my calendar. We're getting free lunch right. today. Like that whole narrative, I'm sure, was at the back of their minds like, Ooh, oh, no, oh, no. And exactly. I'm, I, I love that they were pleasantly surprised to have gotten you. So can you yeah. tell us? What kind of doctor you are and why you might be a little bit different to what people may be used to? So, I mean, everybody's an individual and every doctor is definitely different. Um, definitely would say that I'm a pretty good listener. You know, I like to listen to the whole scenario um, that I've had, um, you know, illness in my family um, from, you know, sort of young, younger age. Um, so I know what it's like to have someone who's ill in the family, what it looks like to go through the system, multiple systems. Um, I've always had a good relationship with people if they're older or younger. So I think that's helpful when you're a good communicator, especially one-on-one, you know, I always felt that was better one-on-one than in big groups. So this profession, you know, works well for my personality. Other people work well with big groups and can command that, you know, that's not me. Um, so I kind of found the area, um, in life that works for my kind of communication style. Mm-hmm. I love that. But the, I think that helps, uh, for my particular way of practicing. Yeah, for sure. I think um, I've had a fairly run-of-the-mill regular doctor experience over my lifetime. I've had uh, Lyme's disease before that was not really well-received by a few doctors I had gone through, and I kind of just dead-ended that. But my experience, maybe similar to yours, um, my father was diagnosed with a pretty catastrophic cancer when I was 12. He was given 30 days to live, but then lived an additional 20 years and six months. So over that time frame... It was a lot of doctors that had a lot of I thoughts bet. and a lot of, oh, we don't know how you're here. We don't know what to do for you. And that was an answer that we had to accept. But yeah. it, it was always walking into a doctor's office with a, a literal this thick stack of paperwork wow. and files from his surgeon and his oncologist. I can and that. Oh, my gosh. the the Overwhelming. Man. And <laughs> it was always difficult because I would try to be on my father's side and be like, Daddy, this man has just a few moments to see you. It's not his fault. Like, we have to do our best. Let's, what are we here for today? Let's narrow it down. And he was always so adamant, as he should be. It was his health and his story. He wanted them to know all the things. And he had such a very complicated case. So it was very relevant and pertinent information. But I always felt so, I could see from the outside that there was a systematic problem here and not a doctor problem. This person was just trying their best to serve our community and there just isn't enough resources to go around all the time. And especially in smaller towns, you're just, you're the only doctor in town, you know, there's right. <laughs> yeah. Kind it's of kind of rough. But Absolutely. Where, where was the moment for you where you decided you wanted to a lot more time when 
when you saw fit to be able to accommodate to your, your patient's needs and, and maybe, I guess, to their feelings? So I, I was about 15 years in. Um, and when I, luckily when the when I took over that older practice, it was a fairly small. So I was able to spend more time actually very luckily in the beginning with people. I wasn't as rushed, um, as I could have been, but then 15 years later, fast forward, uh, just to say we went from 200 patients to 10,000 patients, um, in town, 10,000 patients. And we had, um, multiple, I had multiple providers with me by that time. I hired a few doctors, few NPs. Um, I had one unit, two units, three units in the building that I was in um, be, because of the, the, the quantity. And, and it wasn't a problem of patients at that point. So when you start out, you think, oh, my God, I, I'm, I'm really worried I have to get patients to make a living. But soon after that, you realize that's not the hard part. That's the easy part. It's managing all the patients and all the uh, time that, that you have to spend. So 15 years in, um, it was very busy. I would have two, three rooms backed up. I would actually sit in a room and hear someone getting on the scale outside the room or hearing the door turn, the doorknob or slide, or uh, depending on the door, of someone going in the next room and start to panic. Oh, my God, I got to get finished with this patient because I have the one next door and someone on the scale going in the other room. Um, so that was difficult. Um, I only had you know 15 minutes per patient, and sometimes a nurse was in there for five or 10, so that leaves me five or 10. And I really, I did not ever like to keep people waiting. That's also something that from the beginning, I, I didn't like running over and letting someone wait because I hate doing that myself, you know, waiting an hour, two hours for somebody. Um, so that was, um, that was tough. Uh, then it was difficult getting staff. Yeah, you know, it was thinning out. It was hard to get nurses, hard to get doctors. I kind of saw the writing on the wall. I'm like, oh my God, this is really tough. How am I going to practice like this another 15, 20 years or more? Um, so that was the point where um, I decided I had to make a change. Either I had to get out of medicine or do something parallel or change the way I was practicing. And that's when I uh, was lucky enough to um, get involved uh, with a kind of a national uh, a company that, uh, that, that affiliates uh, private doctors and they do a membership-based model. And that changed my practice, changed my life, you know, about seven years ago. So cool. Could you tell us just a little bit more about that? So this is a membership uh, based practice, you know, people call them kind of concierge, it's not full concierge, full concierge is kind of when you go in and you pay a sum um, every year, every month, and there's no copays, there's no insurance, this is kind of a hybrid model, which it makes it a little less expensive than the full um, concierge where they pay a membership fee every year, and we still take insurance um, for visits. Uh, but this allows me to keep my patients uh, have less of a load. Okay, so instead of an average doctor, a busy doctor in this area, um, Philadelphia suburbs, you could have 1,500 to 3,000 patients for one doc. And that's basically where I was very busy and allowed me to, you know, cut it down to just a several hundred, which is a huge difference, you know, um, 10x difference at least. So going from 30, 40 patients in a day at times um, to eight, you know, 10 busy day, wow, 12, you know, so it's, it's a lot different. You can spend a lot of time. We have um, extended um, wellness exams where we really spend an hour to an hour and a half with uh, a patient. That's after they spend an hour with one of my staff members a week or two before in preparation for the physical. Oh, wow. And we go into all the medical problems that you traditionally do, but have time to hit each one and then talk about lifestyle and diet and exercise and mood and, and you know everything. Uh, wow. So it's really a wonderful way to practice. It's kind of the way I thought I would be practicing when I finished my residency or graduated medical school, but never got to really do. And then I was able to do that. Oh, it's a huge so difference. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I bet you feel a lot less angst, stress, anxiety. That's yes. just intense. Not that I'm not moving all day, but I'm not rushed at all. I mean, it's funny because there's times where I'm talking to a patient about the diet and exercise about their sleep and they're like, Hey doc, uh, I got to go, you know, completely opposite than when I was doing before when I'm like backing out of the room and there's, and they're still talking. It's, it's the opposite. I'm like, no, we can discuss your lifestyle a little bit more. Man. So. It's a, uh, it brings a tear to my eye because it's such a, I mean, as a, a patient myself, there's gosh, I have to make a laundry list of questions I have for things that I just don't trust Google to get the answers for. And Good. it's a wide range. It could be diet. It could be a food allergy I have. It could be a, gen a genetic predisposition. And to not have to prioritize and just be able to get through a list must, oh my goodness, your, your patients must just feel such relief after they leave with you to not only have gotten it out, but gotten a timely conversation they do, they back do. and forth. 
and look, they're spending extra money. So I know, you know, it's, it's, they're they're fortunate to be able to do it. I'm fortunate to be able to have them, Uh, but they still really appreciate it. I mean, I have more thank yous now than I did before and they're, and they're, you know, spending a little more money. Uh, but they're, I think they're getting good value. It's, you know, I like to consider it like, or it's an add on, like a gym membership. Um, it's, it's less than a lot of gym memberships. So, um, yeah, it, it's very nice for them and it's just as good for me too. I can feel good about my job. I can, I can be thorough and not leave things on the table or have to go home at night. Did I do this? Did I do that? I should have done that. I should have made that extra call to that specialist, but I have plenty of time to do that now. So it's, oh, it's nice. Man. That it, I bet it feels nice. Yeah. And I love so much that instead of having to put diet, general wellness concerns on the back burner because you have to touch these fire moments. Did you find yourself kind of transitioning into a new place in your practice with being able to focus a bit more on diet and wellness and fitness? Without a doubt. I've always enjoyed that part of practice though. Didn't have enough time for it. I always tried to incorporate it. I think I did a pretty good job under the circumstances, but there was big room for improvement. Um, So now, yeah, then once I started doing that, I really was honing down on on diet and um, lifestyle and the whole recipe of wellness. And then I actually put that into a program in my office uh, that I use with patients, um, a kind of like a, a, a 10 step program on how to, you know, lose weight or maintain weight, how to eat healthy, how to read labels, you know, how to, you know, get that recipe for a better, um, better health, better life. Um, so I incorporated that into my practice for numerous patients. Um, and then during COVID when you really couldn't get out and talk to people as much, then I kind of, uh, put that program into a, um, a, a video program. So then I could, people could do it without coming in and I could extend it to people outside the practice. So I, I really have enjoyed uh, jumping into that aspect of healthcare. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So I find that really fascinating for a few reasons. I think there's, so I think I was maybe the beginning of the generations that started to look at labels, started to think more about like, why does my stomach hurt all the time? Hmm, let me see. I probably can't eat this, probably can't eat that. Yeah. My mother's 74 and it has been whew, maybe like a equivalent to the struggle of trying to get a toddler to eat things that they should or not eat things that they shouldn't. And the logic there of her just... Not understand. I've eaten this my whole life. Why can't I eat this now? And why do I have to look at this label? And what's important about that? And I, I worried about the gaps in the generations that aren't really getting this information, oh, yeah. or maybe it's not being delivered in a way that makes sense to them because they just want the answer so they can plug it into their routine and like keep going with their life. And I, I wonder if you found any kind of apprehension from your patients in receiving the diet, the dietary guidelines, the, your, your framework, was there any kind of them going, Hmm, like light bulb moment, like, wow, okay, maybe that correlates with why I'm not feeling so well, because I'm eating something that has 32 ingredients that aren't even food. Like, yes, was, was yes. there a lot of that? Definitely. Yeah. That was, I love actually it's my favorite moment in medicine. Um, if, if it's wellness or health or anything that you're talking to somebody about when they go, ah, oh, yeah, I get it. Aha, that aha moment. You know, I love that. Um, but absolutely. And I really try to bring it down to the uh, you know, least common denominator um, for people to understand, because we throw a lot of information about that to them. And, you know, you go to a nutritionist and they give you, you know, a whole paper full of rules to do, you know, okay, if you follow it, you will be healthy, but there's no way you're following that all at once. So I, I always like to, you know, start with one little thing, like you said about a label, Hey, why don't we look at added sugars or let's just look at the ingredients and try to see what we're taking here. And then we can look at the rest of the label later. Uh, but absolutely, uh, that's it's 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 uh, it's amazing to be able to do that, and it's so important um, that we we teach people, no matter how old they are, younger or older, and, and people are willing to learn um, if you can break it down for them. And also, they actually have to be willing too. So there's patients that you know that want to hear it, um, and there's patients that do not want to hear it. So if you start talking, hey, do you want to talk about your diet or health? And they're like, I absolutely do not. I don't want to. I don't care. It's a little harder than when someone's actually interested in it. So, yeah. can, and there's both of them. Yeah. Having to lead the horse to water, as they say, is not always the best, but right. I would imagine that because your patients are taking kind of this additional step into having a different kind of, um, exchange with you as, as patient and doctor, do, do you see a little less apprehension because they are kind of taking this extra step to go through that membership, which may kind of. In, envision them having a bit of a healthier yes 
like yes. tr project on their hands, I guess. Not that's really sure interesting. That, but. No, that's a good question. Yeah. I mean, so I would say 75%. You're right. So I've kind of self-selected my patients, right, to be more interested because they're paying to be interested. But I would say I would say 75% of them around that amount are interested in making changes to their health. They're open to suggestion. No, they're not always going to take it. You know, there's some strong little <laughs> people there, um, but they're open. But the, there's about 25% of them who just want to have access. You know, they want to have more time um, and really don't still don't care about the health and wellness aspects though i always bring it up it, but it's interesting too i'll say look when you're ready let's talk about it. i'm not going to force it on you but you have to make the decision just like you want to stop smoking you want to stop drinking you want to stop doing drugs um you want to stop eating x you know you have to want to do it and i'll say when you want to do it let me know i'm here and we'll talk about it and i'll bring it up every year i won't bother you too much in between but we're gonna have a we'll talk about it once a year and then a lot of times they do say okay i'm ready or i'd like to talk about that now yeah i would love to know what some of the tenants are of your program that you've created just in kind of gathering all of the typical things that people needed help with in these particular areas. Um, would you mind just kind of breaking down what the main points of focus are with, within your program if someone were to be working with you? Sure. I'd love to. So, so just to go back when I was working with people over the years, like I said, I was always interested in how people were losing weight, what they were doing, helping talk to them about nutrition. And I just started to notice that when people really started to do things, they started to maybe look at certain programs. They did, you know, Weight Watchers, they did Nutrisystems, they did uh, you know, Atkins, you know, no bread, no pasta, no carbs, you know, all grapefruit, whatever the diets were, um, exactly that. They were diets that people would lose weight, 20, 30, 40 pounds. Great, excellent. And then six months later, boom, they would, they would come back. Uh, and that was really frustrating. Even myself, I was uh, never really heavy, but I would have times where I'd be 10, 15, at one point, 20 pounds overweight, and I would always get down, but certainly enough, I'd pop back up. So I, ha I just kept thinking about this, and then I started looking at people who were successful over periods of time, and what, what are they doing that other people are not doing? And every single time, I realized that I took notes on patients and uh, you know, journals, reading, like what, why, how are people successful or people who are not? And it's always, always, always the people who do it slowly. I know you might not want to hear that or people might want to hear that, but if you lose 30 pounds in three months through diet, you're 99.999% of the time, you're going to gain it back every time. Um, but the ones that lose one, two, three, one, two, three, one pound, two pound, three pound, one pound a month, uh, they're going to be successful. And I noted that when people lost weight and kept it off for a year and, and especially two, they kept it off pretty much forever. Um, mm. So... I took that and said, well, all right, we have to figure out a way um, to do this with people and not tell them to concentrate on the results, but concentrate on the journey. Okay. Cause they're two separate things and there's two ways to look at it. So you need to embrace the journey and don't embrace the results cause that'll happen anyway. Yeah. So then I looked, well, how did they learn? How did the people do things? So usually they started to do one or two things at a time, not 10, right? Not, they weren't following the whole list. Um, so I said, I am going to make a program where we do one thing at a time. Okay. We call this seriously simple steps and one thing at a time, if it's a week or two weeks or three weeks, we'll do one thing and one thing only to change your lifestyle. And then after that week's up and you've incorporated, we'll move on and do the next thing. It's like we do in school, right? When you learn to read and write, you know, you don't do it all in a day and you're, you're not writing sentences in a week. You're doing your I's and your T's and you're learning how to write. And then all of a sudden, a year later, you're writing cat or, you know, I love mom uh, out on the, on your um, paper. I don't know if people use still paper anymore. Um, so I decided I'm going to do the same things. By the way, sports, baseball, basketball, guitar, whatever you do, it's always small steps, learning a chord, learning a chord. So that's what I did. I incorporated one step at a time. Um, one simple thing, and then we moved on to the next. And a lot of it is about habits, you know, just taking one habit and either getting rid of it or creating one and sticking to that one thing. Everything else stays the same. You don't have to change everything. Some people want to do everything at once too, right? They, oh, I want more information. I want to do everything today because I want the result tomorrow. No, mm -hmm. we're going to do this one thing and then we're going to add something on. So that's what I did. I said, okay, we're going to look at their habits, do one at a time. We're going to look at um, you know, protein, fats, and carbs, when you get into that, but one at a time and really mm -hmm. drill it down to the basics, what you should be doing and what you should not be doing. Mm -hmm. And that created the system where one week at a time or, or longer, you can do a step over a 10 week period or longer. Wow. 
it's so interesting to hear a doctor speak of things in a manner of mindset and um, thinking ahead, maybe preventative measures that are also going to help you deal with what you're currently maybe ailing um, with. But I wonder, was there apprehension in people basically getting, um, you're almost like a, a health coach of sorts in yeah, terms yeah, yeah. of the mental it, it all needs to click in order for this to work, as yes. you said. And I wonder, I mean, I personally have never, ever in my life, never not once been to any kind of medical appointment where mindset was discussed, even like at a therapy session. It's the so, most important thing. It's the most important thing. I think, I think you have to have that yeah, or else you're set the, up for failure, right? Yeah. Your framework, it, it, it makes so much sense that, you know, if you're given a supplement to take every day, you have to take it every day and to take it every right. day is... A habit and it's it's just so refreshing to hear you saying these words and and it's even cooler that your patients are receiving this knowledge from you in a way that i'm sure is very impactful in the moment of being with you face to face sitting down getting comfortable for a few moments in the seat and not having like that time frame be over and gone in the blink of an eye it's just it's really special. I hope you know how special you. what you have created is because oh, I, really I appreciate that. I pray it takes off and it's copied all thank over the you. world because we need oh, this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what, what does it feel like to be able to give more to your patients without taking from yourself? Oh, it's amazing. I mean, it's great to be able to, uh, uh, to give knowledge, give information, to spend time um, concentrating on things that I feel are important that I, that I feel is important for the patient. Uh, for the community, you know, um, for our lives, um, and then hopefully have them. The best thing is if they can pass it down. So if they can tell their, you know, their partner, their child, their buddy, their coworker, and and I hear that once in a while, which is, I mean, that's that's the biggest reward. Oh, I I told my friend who's been having problems uh, a few things about your program, and and I and I talked them a little bit about you know habits or a little bit about the, um, the proper carbs and how to look at labels and they're really doing well. I'm like, that's phenomenal. It's awesome. You know, if you can pass it down, pass it forward, that's, that's an amazing thing. I love that. And that has to be also something that just keeps you moving forward and developing the things that people can utilize without being your patient. I'm sure your wait list has to be two or three years long at this point <laughs> with the way in which you are you jam packed with. Yeah. So if someone isn't able to work with you in person as your their you being their personal physician, um, what are the ways that they can work with you outside of that? How how can they get this information? How can they kind of get under your your we'll say health guidance? So I um I have a website called seriously simple steps dot com, uh, where this whole program um I developed into a video series, like I said during during COVID. So I have all the steps on there that people can join for a, no a nominal amount. Um, that they can get the series and watch the videos and get information. And this information, by the way, I believe it's good for life. It's not like something that's going to uh, be old, uh, you know, three months from now or six months from now. You know, it's not, these aren't uh, fad ideas. These are ideas. These are not ideas. These are scientific, uh, uh, scientific knowledge about wellness and health and longevity um, that people can incorporate into their lives and their families' lives. Um, so they can go to that site and they can learn more about it. I have several blogs uh, for free that people can read um, on that site. Also, drkolka.com is another site that I put more uh, other wellness type information. If it's something that might be current in the news about um, uh, programs, vaccinations, um, diet trends, health trends, um, issues. Uh, so they can go to either one of those, drkolka.com or seriouslysimplesteps.com or follow me on Instagram. Same Oh, yeah. We'll put all those links in the show notes for sure. I love that people are going to have access to your information. Um, as I said before, we're just, man, especially with social media accounts, we are so inundated with information that, as you said, could be a fad, maybe isn't even yes. real or fact-checked. It's a really weird... It's scary. I, it is. And I, I mean, I started with a regular doctor that I trust when I was a child, and I don't have these built-in fears because of social media and that, you know, it's like, no, no, I, a doctor went to school for this and they know what needs to be done. And hello, I'm going to, I'm going to lean to a doctor before AI. So Good. I, yeah. I love that people can access you in that regard rather than 
WebMD or, you know, siphoning through a Google search, they still don't understand because yeah. they don't really feel a connection or have a space with their physician to where they can kind of get a little bit of guidance without coming in, that having that be yeah, having that be the right. only thing they can ask, and then they've got to get out and then come back again in three months when you can get your next appointment. You're right. It's a, a genius thing that you're providing, and I think people are going to be very open to the idea of it because we need access to the experts that can help us with our health. I think it's we we could learn how to crochet a sunflower into like a hammock and like all you know, we can do so <laughs> right, much. Yeah. But there's no way to decipher what's real and what's fabricated or what's trumped yes. up in a way that like we should be able to get to the very bottom of what the essence is of taking care of ourselves without it being a guessing game. You're right. I mean, it's crazy because I, I think probably the kid next door can uh, do a website for $100 and it's going to look like WebMD or better. And it looks like he knows what he's talking about. And people go to yeah. these sites and they and they because they come in with it. People show me things I'm like, oh, my God, that's don't follow that. But it looks real. It looks great. Great website. So it's very scary. You can look, it looks like legitimate information. So that you're right. It's, it's very difficult out there. I would love for you to just state very quickly, what are the, we're not going to throw any kind of holistic people under the bus here. They are their own entity. They do their thing. They're not physicians. They're not doctors, but what types of, um, I mean, clearly everyone is going to come to you now on social media for all of their needs and they're going to follow everything you post and learn yeah. from you. And you hit, guys, he has some really amazing blog articles. Like I learned a lot in preparing for this conversation by just so reading glad. your blogs. They're beautiful and they're so well written in a way that, you know, non-doctors can understand and also merge into your life. So please check out everything. But if they are looking for... A particular thing, maybe. What are some credentials we need besides a DR or an MD attached to someone's name that could help us to siphon through all the experts? Well, you have to get to a legitimate source. You know, is it a, in in terms of if you're looking at social media? You know, is this source um, uh, something that you know and understand? Um, just for say, like, is is it a newspaper like the New York Times? Is it you know Bob's backseat paper? You know, something you know, uh, some other unnamed uh, entity. You have to be really careful of that and who's writing these articles. Like you said, are they certified? Are they a physician? Are they a certified nutritionist? Are they a certified wellness coach? Are they just Joe, you know, whoever from the local gym. It's a big difference, right? So we have to make sure that we're listening to people that are credentialed and have a history. Um, and especially if you have a relationship with them, that's the best. Like you said, if you have a physician that you know, um, or if you're following someone online that you know their credentials uh, and you trust yeah. them, um, that's good. But it's always good to have a trustworthy source and to filter yeah. that out. Yeah, it's, it's getting scary out here, guys. But we now all have this wonderful physician at our fingertips and he oh, is okay. available just a click away if someone were looking to head into their doctor if they're nowhere near you what is one thing that you would have them ask their doctor today that's just a basis for health that they may not be able to get in because they're always coming with an ailment like is there one base thing that over time someone should be paying attention to maybe their cholesterol I'm not, I'm not really sure because no one's ever told me. So I'm just curious if there's right. a thread of something in our, let's say our thirties, thirties through fifties, what should we be looking at or asking our doctor? Hey, how's this level looking? How's this looking? How much time do you have? <laughs> I have. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> no, the, the, um, there's definitely several things. It depends on the person, right? Because everyone could have different issues. Um, mm -hmm. So there is no one answer because every, you know, otherwise it would be easy. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, generally at that age, you you want to look, right? You want longevity, right? So you want your 30s, you feel good. You want to live to 80s, 90s or more. And you want to be active and you want to be enjoying those years. So typically the things that, that do slow people down are weight. You know, if you're overweight, uh, that can lead to problems. Um, like the big, you know, uh, three high blood pressure, high cholesterol and diabetes. Um, those are the three big ones that will generally slow people down beyond malignancies. That's a whole different type of issue. Um, but those three are the ones that are going to lead to chronic disease states, um, problems with your heart, problems with your brain, problems with your cognition, problems with movement. Okay. With moving your body. Um, mm -hmm. so those are the top three, blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, to make sure they're under control, especially you getting into your adulthood. 
um, and your weight, which affects all of those, all of those three. And how, what can you do now to improve the outlook in all of them as you go on? Not that maybe you're going to um, reduce the risk 100%, but if you can reduce the risk of you know, developing some of those, or you can reduce the risk of worsening, of escalation of some of these problems, then you're going to be well off later in life. It, it does seem, um, I'll say as someone, I'm almost 40, I've watched a lot of family friends, adults, teachers that I've had, they started out, you know, I remember them in their 30s-ish teacher age when they're yeah. small, and you see them so severely decline, mm. and it's so terrifying. And I think it's given maybe my age group a little bit of like medical anxiety, like, oh no, I'm gonna get cancer, I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna yeah. get that. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about what we know now about how you can really manipulate and take control of your health at an earlier age to really try to sweep out, as you said, a lot of that diabetes, blood pressure. Like I, I think people think it's kind of like a lost cause that at some point in your no. life you're going to be unwell. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think there's a lot of medical anxiety really clouding the field of people thinking that they can live a full, long, healthy life. Yeah. First of all, it's never too late. Okay. Almost never. Um, and two, um, you, you can do things today that even if you do get sick, you're unlucky and things happen, you'll be better off of if you take care of yourself, right? They always say, if you take care of yourself, you could take care of someone else. Um, like you have a sick, you know, father, mother, grandparent, partner. If you take care of yourself, you're going to be able to handle them better. And that's true. I see that all the time. Yeah. So, you know, we need to work on things now so you don't end up having those problems then. So if you can move your body every day, those who move, keep moving. And those who don't, don't mm -hmm. carry. And that's a big thing. So if you don't move your body, try to do it every day, you're going to run into problems later that if you, if you exercise, and I don't care what you do, it doesn't matter. So you could whatever floats your boat, you want to walk, you want to jog, you want to go on a treadmill, elliptical, play pickleball, um, tennis, croquet, whatever you like. Um, just do something every day. Um, and you will decrease the risk of, um, you know, obesity, or mm -hmm. it'll help. It'll help with blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, wellness, brain. So that's, that's definitely one thing that people can start doing right away. That's a major one. And I would also say added sugars. Try to keep the added sugars low. I know you're not going to have zero. And then that's also something I don't, you don't have to be perfect, okay? You just have to make better decisions more often, okay? One or two better decisions every day will make a difference over not doing them. Okay, so you don't have to incorporate everything. And the more you do over time, uh, it just kind of builds on itself, just like the other way. You stop doing things and you're not eating well and it just kind of snowballs. So just a little bit at a time, making better decisions will lead to big results down the road. But added sugars, look at products. If you see four or five, six grams of added sugar, it's really easy. Look right at the label. It says sugar and then added sugars. It's the added ones, not the natural ones that are as, mm. as um, important which uh, I go into in my series, why that's important and how to look at them. Uh, but I like to look at it and say, all right, if it's more than two or three grams per serving on a label, I'm not picking it up. I'm not taking it. You know, I'm just not going to do it. I like to have zero, but one or two is okay. Um, yeah. If you keep your sugars down low, it, it, excess sugars will build up and cause diabetes, cause weight gain, mm -hmm. and excess sugars will turn into cholesterol because if you don't use them during the day, you'll store them as cholesterol. So keep the added mm -hmm. sugars down. Just look at some products. And move your body. Those mm -hmm. are the biggest things that you can do. It It's very simple and can seem overwhelming, yeah. but I'm so thankful that it's simple because everyone can do it. It is. Yeah. And as you stated, just takes some habits being enforced, some, some mindset tweaks, maybe a little change yeah. here or there. And you um, can't wait for the habit to come to you, right? So that'll never happen. Oh, I'll wait to get motivated tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. You know what? Start today. And then eventually when you do it every day, it becomes a habit. It just won't yeah. form. Yeah. I think it's a, uh, I can speak from personal uh, health issues. They're very slight, but it took years and years and years for me to recognize that I could not digest soy. Couldn't mm. do it. Made me really yeah. ill, made me really sick all the time. And it took my body and my immune system just being so broken down from it just being in everything and me eating it and not understanding and yeah. doing an elimination diet, got rid of gluten, got rid of soy. And 
the moment I started to feel better, I was like, holy crap. Wow. I knew that just food could yeah. be breaking my body down in such a way. Absolutely. But I'm very thankful for that episode. And there are still bouts. I still have stomach issues I'm working on. But it showed me the power that I have with just one change. That's right. Whew, it was like night and day in about a month. And I wish so much that others could understand that you don't have to wait for that thing to make you have to do these things. And right. I'm young, but I, if I could give anyone advice, start now, take right. his advice and utilize his program and really just work on your habits in a way that are going to put health at the forefront and less about convenience. Convenience is expensive in the long run, especially for your health. And I would just love to know what your one wishes for those listening today and, you know, regarding a change that they could make for their, for their health, for their life. First of all, uh, you want to work with me? You sound great. I, lo I love what you're saying. <laughs> oh, it's great. <laughs> I, I, it's sure. very motivational. No, it's good. It, 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 exactly what you're saying is my beliefs and, and I it's great. I love it. Um, so I, w I would just say pick one thing, anything, you know, one step that you think that's healthy. You know, is it, is it cutting out sugar is fine. Um, is it not stack snacking after dinner and cutting out those extra snacks that you're doing? Fine, mm -hmm. just pick that one thing. If it's just getting outside and going for a 30 minute walk every day, pick that, pick one thing that mm -hmm. is that you know is healthier than you're doing now and just do that. Just do that for a while. And when you get used to that, then do the next thing. Uh, but I wouldn't try to do 10 things or say I'm gonna wake up today and be perfect and have 500 calories for the day and you know it's gonna blow up anyway. So just pick one thing that's a little bit, a little bit healthier than yesterday and mm -hmm. keep going. Oh, that's so, it's so perfect and makes the most sense to be honest. Um, so my final question is always this, Matthew, how do you make your life rich? How do I make my life rich? Relationships uh, makes my oh. life rich. <laughs> Absolutely. So relationships with my family, you know, my wife, my children, um, uh, um, my extended family, my patients and my friends. So it's all about relationships. Nothing else really matters, right? What, what, what we do in this world. Um, and I realize that as I get older, it's about the experience you have with others. That's mm -hmm. what, um, being rich is to me. Absolutely. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love that yeah. so much. And kudos to your patients who get to receive that love every time they're with you and your students that are using your video course, everyone, all of the links will be in the bio. If you would love to get in touch with this amazing doctor that I just know is going to have such a ripple effect in people's health. I love the generational hand down of information. I, I didn't even think of that, but you are impacting so many lives and I'm sure many more than you're aware of, but thank you for going against the grain and doing something that felt right to you and for just caring about your patients and truly caring about health. It's, it's so beautiful and so special. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And it's thank an you so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. <laughs> Okie dokie, we're all done.